How do I start this timer, I wonder? Are you going? Timer. Okay. Hi. Good morning. My name is Chad. I work at a company called YouGov, and I'm here to talk about Aspen, which is a web framework, a next generation web framework. Um, has anybody heard of Aspen? A few folks. All right, cool. So this, um, this that, that's good because this is a pretty intro introductory talk. Um, we're going to go in three parts on this talk, okay? Uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is really general. How do we make things? Okay, can we get more general than that? Um, and then the second thing we're going to look at is what web development experience do we want? So we're going to talk about how do we make things, then we're going to look at how do we make a web development framework, what sort of experience do we want to deliver with a web development framework? And then the third question is how does Aspen deliver this experience, okay? So we're going to get to Aspen towards the end of the talk and look at the specifics of it, but I want to frame that um, with some more general discussion so you kind of understand the philosophy behind Aspen and where it's coming from, okay? So, first question, how do we make things? This is Chad's rule for how to make things. It's in quotes because I'm about to say it. Design from the outside in, Build from the inside out, okay? Say it with me. Design from the outside in, build from the inside out, okay? Chad's rule of making things. So what you do when you want to make something is you start from the outside, right? You say, what's the experience that I want to deliver here, you know? Um, the last talk I was in was the uh, MVC talk in here and, and Howard was building a game, right? So the question is, all right, what do I want the experience to be like in this game? Um, you know, it's a shoots and ladders type game. So, um, you know, I want, this is the experience I want, right? So you start from the outside and you start with what's the user experience and what's the user seeing, and then you work backwards from there to say, all right, what do I need to do to deliver this experience, right? What do I need to do um, to, uh, you know, to deliver on the promise of what, of the experience I'm trying to deliver? That was a lot of words saying the same thing over and over. Design from the outside and build from the inside out. General principle. Let's look at three examples. Um, of this principle in action. First one, Chipotle, okay? Who here has never eaten at a Chipotle Mexican grill? Never eaten, okay, there's one down the street. If you want, we can go out for lunch, it's on me afterwards, okay? Um, Chipotle is fast casual dining, right? You go there to get burritos, okay? And the reason I use Chipotle as an, as, as an example is because this principle, namely designed from the outside and built from the inside out, is general. It doesn't just refer to software. It doesn't just refer to user interface. It doesn't just refer to visual design. It refers to design of anything, building anything. So I want to build a brand. I want to build a restaurant chain. And how do I do that? Well, I design from the outside in. I build from the inside out. Take a minute and digest this quote from the founder of Chipotle. Okay, so what did he start with, right? He started with the food and the experience. He started with the outside, okay? He started with the way Chipotle was going to look and taste and feel. That was the thing he started with. He said, I have this vision for this, you know, this restaurant where you can go in and, you know, um, you know, there's brushed metal everywhere and there's plywood and you can, you know, there's a really, there's a menu that's simple and it's a big font so, you know, um, you're not overwhelmed by possibilities and you can order simply and we can move you through and I can, um, you know, uh, and, it's, and it's healthy, right? Uh, it's, it's, you know, he's using organic ingredients and natural meat and all this stuff, right? He starts with the outside, the experience he wants to deliver, and then he works backwards from there to deliver that experience, does whatever it take, uh, takes to deliver that experience, right? And you end up with yummy burritos in this case, okay? So this principle, designed from the outside in, built from the inside out, um, is a general principle of, about making anything, okay? So speaking of addiction, here's the second example. Um, Google, right? Google says, here's the experience I want to deliver. I want to be able to type a few words into a, a box on a bare bones web page. And this, of course, is their absolutely radical major redesign overhaul. You know, the newest thing they've done in 15 years or whatever it's been, okay? But the user interface is still very simple. You put a few words into a text box and you get back a few links. 
What user interface could be simpler than this? What user experience could be simpler than this? Design from the outside in, build from the inside out. So we design from the outside in, we say here's the experience we want to deliver, right? And the simplicity of the experience is really um, belies sometimes how deep you have to go and dig down before you can build back up from the inside out to deliver that experience. Before you know it, you're building data centers on the banks of the uh, Columbia River in Oregon um, to deliver this very simple experience, right? So you design from the outside in, and then you build, you dig down as deep as you need to and build from the inside out. Um, so that's a software example. Um, getting a little more specific, Python. Python, the reason we love Python is because it's designed from the outside in. And it's built from the inside out, right? Um, Guido looks at language design as uh, he looks at syntax as an interface, right? We as developers um, are, are users of Python, right? And we're, we're having an experience of this interface, which is the syntax, right, of the language. Uh, and he considers it in those terms and designs the syntax as an interface that developers are using, okay? So an example here would be the ternary operator, right? If A, then B, else C, right? This is what we know from uh, C-style languages from JavaScript. Pretty wooden translation of, uh, you know, the expanded block form of the conditional. First you have the condition, then you have the if, you know, the first block and then the second block, right? So when we go, when we have this expanded form, we say, hey, wouldn't it be neat if we could cram that all in one line? Well, the obvious thing to do is to just cram it all in one line, right? So who knows what the form is in Python? B if A else C, right? Did anybody follow any of the discussion? Have you ever looked into the discussion, the design discussions for why this was implemented like this, right? And that's an exercise. If you go back and look at the mailing lists, um, you know, when they were designing this feature, um, you see this process that I'm talking about in action, designing from the outside in. You start with what's the experience I want to deliver, and then you do whatever it takes to deliver that experience. You build from the inside out, okay? So those are three examples illustrating that point. How do we make things? Design from the outside in, build from the inside out, okay? You all with me? Okay, general. Let's zoom in a little bit. All right. Are you guys actively doing web development right now? Anybody not really actively doing web development? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> what web development experience do we want? Those of us who are doing web development and those who might come to it later, what's the experience we want to have when we're doing web development? All right, let's look at that question. All right, so um, here are a few different uh, sort of categories of technologies uh, that are used, uh, classifications of experiences that we have as web developers. You know, up here we have uh, good old static and or CGI, then the ASP PHP model, MVC model, object-oriented model, and then other. So I want you to think right now about the very first time you put an application or website on the network. The first time you built a website or a web application, Think about what technology you used for that, and then which category it falls in here, okay? So if the first time your virgin experience building a website was using static files and or CGI, raise your hand. All right, old timers, good. Okay, if, uh, if your first experience was in the second category, you, you built a PHP site, raise your hand. Keep it up, come on, raise your hand. Okay, okay. Um, that was actually my first, so my hand's up on that one. Um, so third category, MVC, Django, Rails. Okay. What? You want to put it before MVC? Yeah. Chronologically? Yeah. Yep. Okay, fine. You know what? Fine. No, fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. You no? Know? Thank you. No, I'm sorry. You're right. I actually th uh, did that, and then for whatever reason, I changed it back. So let's do that. Okay. Okay. You back in it? Is that better? <laughs> Everyone happy? Cool. Okay. All right. So third category. Um, 
We already did MVC. We're going to do it again. Object oriented. So, cherry pie. First one? Not first one. Okay. Um, anybody not raise their hand yet? Any others? What you use something else? What did you use? What was the first technology you used to build a website? First website? Notepad. So, it was static files or what? What was it? Okay. So you're just putting static HTML files on the web. Good, okay. So now I want you to imagine this. Imagine it's your first week on a new job as a web developer, okay? Your first week on the job, and you have just been pitched this curveball, okay? And your job, should you decide to accept it or not, because it's your job, is to fix this error, right? Okay, so up here, it's kind of small. We can see example.com slash site slash site slash page dot HTML 404 not found. What do you do to fix this error? Okay. Do you want to just do a touch page on HTML? Yes, you you're done. Yes, you win. Congratulations, exactly, okay? I expect page dot HTML to be there. And it's not, okay? Page.html page is some content that I expect to be there and it's not. So to fix this, I go and I find page.html and I stick it, I go to my, you know, www.doc root, right? And I go into the site directory and I put the page there. Do I restart the server? No, right? It's a static file. I don't need to restart the server for a static file. All I do is hit refresh and my page is there, okay? Nice and easy, right? Static. HTML. Static files are easy to build. What could be simpler than putting a static file on the web? Okay, but what are the problems with static files? They're static, right? They're not dynamic. We can't, we can't generate these resources dynamically. Okay, so we get CGI. So here's your second curveball at work, right? <laughs> You've got example.com slash CGI bin, app.cgi with a query string on it, 500 internal server error. Now you need to debug this one. What do you do? Log files, okay, so you find the log file and you have your error message, and then what do you do? You're gonna go to your CGI bin directory and you're gonna open up app.cgi, right? And then you're gonna use that log file and you're gonna debug the file from there, right? Um, okay, but what are the problems with CGI's? We all know what the problems with CGI's are, right? Why aren't we using CGI's? Maybe we are. Yeah, right, if you're, especially if you're doing interpreted languages, right, you have to start up, for example, if app.cgi were, were a Python file, you have to start up the interpreter on every page request, right, which adds a ton of overhead. Uh, you know, if app.cgi is a compiled binary, then you don't have that, but, um, but yeah, so we don't use CGI's anymore, we want to use interpreted languages uh, for rapid development, so let's start using PHP, okay? So now we've got at PHP, you know, page PHP with an error, okay? And how do we debug this one? We go to our log files, and then we go to our doc root, we go to app, and we get page.php. We open that up and we start debugging it, right? So the nice thing about these is that the developer experience for this common task of debugging a web app, the developer experience is actually um, pretty nice in that you know the file you need to open, right? When you see this, you know you can translate pretty directly, well, I'm gonna go to this directory, and I'm gonna open this file, and I'm gonna be off and running in fixing this error, right? That's kind of nice, it's, it's simple, right? Um, and with the, uh, with the CGI example and the PHP example, we s start to add a little more power into our development environment. The experience that we have as web developers, we're not limited to just static files, we have some, some power uh, that we can bring to our applications. But what's the problem with PHP? <laughs> I'll see you in three days when we're done talking about this, right? Um, you know, sort of the canonical, I kind of easy answer to this is, um, PHP makes it really easy to, uh, to write spaghetti code, right? It makes it really easy to, it, it's really easy to start a file, right? To start an application, to get something off the ground, but it doesn't really scale as the, as the project matures and grows, right? Or it doesn't naturally do so, you know, and obviously there's people doing 
um, you know, like MVC pattern kind of stuff in PHP, et cetera. Um, you know, PHP has object orientation now and whatnot. But it doesn't make it easy to write um, well-factored apps and hard to write uh, poorly factored apps, okay? So let's look at um, one more curveball that we're thrown here. Now look at our URL. It's a lot prettier, isn't it, right? This is, this is one of the reasons that we move away from uh, PHP, or the, in, if we're using PHP, then we're going to use something like mod rewrites or whatever, right, um, to, to have our nice clean URLs. Clean URLs being another, um, another aspect of good design, right, and another aspect. Uh, you're building a good application, right? You're building it. You're, you're, um, you're, it's easy to build better applications than to build poorly factored applications or applications with poor UIs, okay? So now it's your first week on the job and you get this page and you're asked to debug this page. Now what do you do? Okay, so you go look at urls.py if you're using, right, okay? What if you're using something else, right? HD access or, you know, if you're in Zope, then you're doing object traversal. Um, Okay, so there. It's more complicated than that. I mean, you, uh, you first have to look at your Apache config or NGINX config. Okay. And then you have to see whether it's proxy or be mod uh, or whatever. Okay, so you might have some layers in there. Okay, so, so now we're using, let's say we're using an object oriented framework or an MVC framework. And now we've got a lot more power. Okay. We've got, uh, we've got some niceties that help us avoid spaghetti code, right, and, and allow our apps to scale uh, and mature uh, cleanly and well. But we've lost some of the simplicity, right? We've lost the simplicity is the point I'm trying to make here, is that when I look at this page, like when I get this, when I get this page and I sit here and I look at this page, I look at this and I go, oh, man, I start swearing to myself, you know? I'm like, God, where, where the heck? is app bar buzz blue, you know? Because what I see here, like this looks a lot like a path to me, you know? So my brain is like, all right, that's a path. I know what to do with paths, you know? Me as a developer experiencing this. But then there's like this whole crazy, you know, convoluted fifth dimension, which varies depending on framework, you know? and which requires a lot of learning to understand, do I know that I need to look at earls.conf or do I know what the standard traversal is in Rails or in Zope? You know, I have to learn all that. I have to load all that crap in my brain and then I have to, I have to like send, I have to, I have to send the, ma you know, the, the path through that crap in my brain and come out the other end to know what file I'm loading on the file system to debug this, okay? So we added power, we cleaned up some of the spaghetti, but we lost the simplicity, right? So what web development experience do we want? Do I want anyway? I want simple, I want powerful, and clean. Can I have all three? Okay, can I have all three? Or is this, uh, is this pick two, right? Can I, can I as a web developer in my day-to-day, -day, you know, grunting away, checking off these tickets, is, uh, is my experience simple, is it powerful, and is it clean? So, Ta-da! How does Aspen deliver this experience? Okay. How are we doing on time? We're 20 minutes in. We're doing good. All right. You guys tracking? So how do we make things? Design from the outside in, build from the inside out. Okay. And then when we're making um, a web development platform, what's the experience we want to deliver there? What do we want to design? What do we want to design our experience to be? We want it to be simple, powerful, and clean. So now we're going to look we're going to dive in and look at Aspen and how Aspen tries to, uh, tries to deliver this experience. All right, so Aspen sticks pretty closely with the HTTP concept of a resource, okay? So any of those URLs I looked at, right? You know, we're all RESTful developers here. We like these clean URLs. And these are resources, right? This is an HTTP resource. So in Aspen, Every resource is, where am I, excuse me. Okay, so every resource 
is one file in the file system, right? So we're back to static days. We're back to, um, really back to static days because PHP and uh, app CGI, those don't really map cleanly to a resource, right? Uh, which is why we got into MVC and rewrites in the first place. But in Aspen, every URL you see, every URL path, every resource maps to exactly one file on the file system, okay? Using your directory. So when I see it, uh, when I see it in the URL bar, I know I go to my doc root and I know which file I'm gonna open up to debug that, okay? Now, those files are broken up into multiple pages, okay? So an Aspen resource is one file with multiple pages. So let's look at an example. Um, and since we designed from the outside in, we built from the inside out, we're gonna start with, this is the experience we want to deliver to the user, okay? We want greetings program. So my friend Steve, everyone say hi to Steve. Hi Steve. Steve and I were in business together years ago using Zope and Plone. Uh, we ran a web design shop together for five years before he took, uh, yeah, we, Steve now teaches philosophy. He's, uh, he's, in, he's in the philosophy program here at OSU. What's that? It does, man. <laughs> Plone is a drug, look out, it's, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, so Steve, so Steve now teaches um, business, business ethics class and he likes to say that um, Steve and I ran a, an ethical business together right into the ground. So, um, so this is the experience we want to deliver. We want to deliver greetings program to our client. I brought that up because Steve is on a campaign and I want you to know about this campaign because it's important. Okay, hello world has served us well. Okay, hello world has served us well for many decades and will always have a place in the annals of computer science. But the future is greetings program. Okay, so we're on a, a mini campaign to use greetings program instead of hello world, which is why it's here. Detour, end parenthesis. All right, so this is the experience we want to deliver. Greetings program with a bunch of exclamation points. And if we refresh that, we want to get a random number of exclamation points. That's the experience we want to deliver here, okay? So how do we do it using Aspen? This is an Aspen resource. It's a file in my file system, desktop by Ohio index HTML, okay? Who can tell me what that is that wasn't in here before the talk started and we were talking about this? Anybody recognize that bad boy? What's that? Yes, it's an ASCII page break character. It's a form feed, okay? And if anybody has any lore about form feeds that they want to share, I just know it from the, uh, from the email package in the standard library where Barry Warsaw uses it to split his files into multiple pages because in Emacs you can actually navigate um, through, uh, through a file based on these characters, right? Now, it's a little tricky because this is actually two characters. This is cheating. This is a caret and this is an L, okay? Because some editors like Text Wrangler don't really have very great support for ASCII page breaks. And they also don't show up on websites. So Aspen supports either character. You can use a page break or you can use the control L. And so what this is doing is it's splitting this file, which is a resource, it's an Aspen resource, splitting it into three pages, okay? So page one is Python. This is Python. Page one is Python. And we're doing from random import rand int. Okay, so this page, this page gets run once. When your application starts up and you get this page, it gets run once. And then what happens is the namespace that, uh, that this runs in is cached for a subsequent call. So what you want to think of is control flow is kind of top to bottom through this page, through the pages in this file, okay? So first you run this, so now what that means, what that means that that namespace is cached is when I get to page two, which is also Python, now this name is available to me in page two because it was imported up here. Does that make sense? Okay, so now this is also Python. Anyone want to take a guess how that page behaves? that's rendered on each request, right? So every time you hit this page, it runs through this um, using the namespace from up there, so all those names are available. And so I have that rand in, and then I'm defining this extra excitement, right? That's my exclamation points. And then I get down here, and this is no longer Python. We recognize the curly braces. This is a template page, okay? So the syntax for page three in here is a template. And you can see that this name Again, it filters down, right? Names filter down. So anything defined here is available in all of them. Anything here is here. 
and then you can actually, you know, do whatever, templating in here. So extra excitement, right? And that's where our exclamation points come from, and that's how we deliver our user experience. Okay? You tracking with me? Any questions? Yeah, sure. What's your name? Eric. Hi, Eric. Which one do you want? Yep. Like that? Okay, okay. Um, um, I think, yeah, let's, let me see. I think that, yeah, let me just continue and we'll hit that right away. Good question. So there's actually four types of resources that Aspen recognizes. Static, template, JSON, and socket. Uh, and we'll step through each one of these. And the one we just looked at was actually a template resource. Um, so uh, we'll hit that here. Static resources are, are easy. That's just static files, right? So if you just want to put some you know, PDFs up on the web, you just put PDFs in directory, start Aspen, and you're serving static files. There's nothing more complicated than that, right? Static resources. And then the other dynamic resources, there's three kinds. So there's a, an example of a static resource, simple static file, served from the web, right, over the web. And then, all right, so then to answer your question, Eric, um, Template files are parsed into three pages, and it's predefined which page. So it's the order of the page that determines what the syntax is. Okay, so the first, and it's actually, you know, if I can go into a little more detail here, how am I doing on time? Um, if you just have, uh, these first two pages are optional, actually the if you, if you don't have any page breaks, then it's interpreted as a static file, okay? If I just put one page break in there and then left everything else empty above it, then this would just get parsed as a template, okay? And then if I, then the first one is gonna be the Python request time, and then if I do have three pages, then the first one is gonna be the import. So you think about it filtering through from the top down, yeah? Uh-huh. the first and second Well, the reason is that, um, I don't necessarily want to run this code on every request, okay? So I, I import this, I only need to import it once. Yeah. The other two parts are every request, but the top part is whatever dynamic concept can provide. Yeah, correct. And then the third one is the template. Yep, that's it. Tim. So you have this file, some arbitrary depth in your, uh, you know, your source tree. Okay. What is its Python path for importing your, like, I don't know, your sort of, like, data model that you mm -hmm. have um, I use virtual env, generally. No, I know, but, like, you know, like, you have a this path, source, you mean? blah, 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 and, like, does it, is it at the top level? Is it whatever directory it's in? Where is, like, what files does it see when you, when you load it up? Python modules? What Python modules can you get to? Like, what can I import in there? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It uses your lib directory. So, yeah. Do you guys understand the question? He's asking what, where you can import from here. Um, yeah, it's only it, the things. The thing that Aspen adds. Um, you know, this is this is a little extra uh, information. There's a dot Aspen hidden directory in your website root. If that exists, that's added to your syspath. Okay, so if I want, um, this is maybe a good place to start talking about this. Uh, you'll see it on a slide later. <laughs> one of the, one of the th design goals with Aspen um, is to bring progressive enhancement to the web developer experience. Okay, progressive enhancement is a term that probably some of you are familiar with from uh, the our friends in the design side, right, on the front end. Um, I hit your website with links. I should get something, right? I should get the text, right? And it's progressively enhanced from there. If I have CSS available, I get pretty styles. If I have images available, then I get images. If I have JavaScript, I get behaviors, right? So the idea is that your website supports this range of environments, right? Um, this range of complexity. And it's progressively enhanced from the simplest um, to the most complex. And that's one of the things that I wanted to bring to Aspen. So, you know, here you go. You, you know, I could put 
greetings program, excuse me, up as a static, excuse me, static resource. And um, I, d I don't need to, to run any start project kind of file, you know what I mean? I don't need to generate a whole complex um, you know, file system layout with an MVC directories and all that just to get a stupid honking stinking static page on the web, right? Um, simple. And then when I'm ready to add a little dynamicity to it, I just add it there. I still didn't need to create any extra files or anything, right? I just expanded this. I'm progressively enhancing the experience. Then to get to your question, Tim, from here, I could, you know, start to make my own library somewhere which has unit tested code, et cetera. And then I can use that library in here in this, uh, in this page. And I've added, I've enhanced that, right? I've added, now I create a .aspen directory and I start a, you know, foo.py file in it. Now that's available to import foo top there. Am I answering your question? Okay. Anybody else questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, does that generate um, a compliant HTTP page with the appropriate headers and yeah. all that stuff? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, under the hood, uh, it's using WSGI. Um, so you can actually swap out. There's five different WSGI engines available uh, in Aspen, or you can use it as a WSGI app for whatever else, what other server you want. Uh, yeah, so that wiring's all handled. Yeah? Uh, cookies or other HTTP header controls that you might want to have your um, yeah, there's there's request API for that. Um, yeah, so you would you would do that yourself. Probably put it in a library. You know, hand off the request to it. Should we look at these other two resource types? Okay. So static resources, template resources, JSON resources. So <coughs> Aspen looks at the file extension. If it's a .json file. Your file in the file system is a .json file. It processes it as a JSON resource. JSON resources only have two pages. There is no template page, no third page. Okay? And this is the API for it. You set response.body to an arbitrary object. If that object isn't a string, then uh, the, the machinery, the Aspen machinery, uh, you know, does a JSON dump S on that and uh, sets the headers appropriately and sends it out to the browser as JSON. So this is what it looks like to send JSON out um, using Aspen. Okay? So we use JSON files for our Ajax. And then for our Comet, we want to use socket files. Okay? This is what a socket resource looks like in Aspen. Socket resources have three pages. The top two aren't included here um, because we don't need them for this example. So you get this magic socket object in the third page of your socket resources. The third page of your socket resource. So at the first page executes uh, once on startup. The second page executes once per request. Anybody want to guess what the semantics are for this third page? again? Yes. So every, what happens is that this loops, this goes into a loop. Socket.receive is a blocking call. Okay. And, uh, and this loops forever as long as that socket is connected. Okay. So there's a lot of magic going on here. Has anyone uh, looked at the socket.io library? Okay. Um, socket.io is a cross-browser web socket implementation, more or less. There's a server side, which is uh, implemented for Node.js. And then there's a client library, which um, provides a cross-browser web socket. Do we know about web sockets? Anyone using web sockets or played with them at all? A little bit? So the idea with web sockets and the idea with Comet and, and whatever, real-time applications, you need that persistent connection, right? HTTP is a stateless protocol, right? We send a request, we get a response. We don't have any, you know, we have to jump through all these hoops to, um, to keep a persistent connection with a browser. And WebSockets is the next generation of that, right? So you've got a two-way pipe with WebSockets where you can send stuff and you can receive stuff um, back and forth with your server. But, you know, older clients don't support WebSockets, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's different, um, different implementations. 
Um, and so you've got this socket.io library, which wraps all that uh, magically into a client-side API for communicating with the server. But you need a server-side implementation to take advantage of that, right? So node.js uh, is the implementation for node is the canonical implementation for socket.io. Um, and what we're doing in Aspen, what I'm doing in Aspen is I'm writing a, uh, a socket.io server-side implementation um, so that you can use these web sockets to do real-time applications. Okay? Socket.send, socket.receive. So here's an echo file uh, behind it, but obviously there's no, um, you know, the, the question is where's that UI coming from, right? Well, you can see in the URL. Anyone want to guess what file I'm going to open to find out where the echo.html UI is coming from? Yeah, thank you. Slow pitch. Okay. Echo HTML, right? So this is, um, this is JavaScript that's loaded on the client side and this app.socket, so this socket here is one of these socket.io cross-browser web sockets. And I do a socket.send value and then this socket.receive is blocking until it sends, right? So it gets this value here and then I'm sending it right back to the client side and the client side handler isn't on the screen, but you can imagine it. Okay, that's socket resources. So now we see an example of a socket and a static resource. And, you know, that's where I was going next was that um, Aspen resources bring progressive enhancement to the developer experience, right? You start with a single HTML file, and then you grow it as big uh, as you need it, but you don't get all the spaghetti of a PHP, right? Because, all right, you guys ready for this? This is my favorite quote about Aspen. Right? <laughs> I love this. Aspen seems insane to me. Yes, it does. So, unlike PHP, you can't mix. Uh, you know, so other people have said, um, you know, mixing logic and presentation is a total non-starter for me, right? Well, I like to think that you're actually bringing logic and presentation as close together as possible without mixing them, right? Because you can't drop into arbitrary Python blocks in here, right? So you don't, that, that sort of nips that, uh, that PHP tendency in the bud um, when you can't do that, right? You're, you have this, um, you know, this light formalization where you're, you know, where you're saying, all right, put your Python code here, you know, write your libraries, and then do your templating down here. Um, and so it sort of, it, it encourages you towards a modular, uh, you know, uh, development uh, for your mature applications, right? But it doesn't limit you when you just want to get started and you don't want to think about all the crap. You just want to get something on the web now, right? And it's also nice to be able to start adding features. You know, it doesn't take a ton of work to add a new feature to a site. You just create a new page and you're off and running, right? Progressive enhancement of the developer experience. All right? That one. Yes, insane. All right, so that's what I got. How do we make things? Design from the outside in, build from the inside out. What sort of web development experience do we want to make? We want to make one that's simple, powerful, and clean all at the same time. And how does Aspen deliver, blooper reel, how does Aspen deliver this experience with Aspen resources, one file and multiple pages? Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Um, there's API, this is actually Tornado is the templating language, um, you know, so there's an include and a extends, uh, whoa, where am I, lost it, ah, come back. Um, you have several, uh, request types that all interlap through the same code itself. Yeah. Say you're going to have, mm -hmm. um, both HTML, JSON, XML. Um, different responses based off of, you know, what I, I end up doing a lot is the the last, you know, after everything after the dot, okay. that determines the request type. But all the code, you know, what's what's being provided in the request is identical. Right. Just maybe the format's different. Okay. On the output, the the data identical too, just differently formatted. How would how would you handle a situation like that? In Aspen, you would model that with three different files that used a library underneath, right? Okay. So you would have all your common stuff in a library have three files that import that and then dump it to different formats. 
Yeah. Here, I think. Um, how does resource look up happen when you have mm -hmm. uh, resource locations that are data dependent? So if I have a right. catalog and I've got three extra steps on the tab mm -hmm. that don't have resources because they didn't exist when you're writing it. Yeah. There's two, uh, two ways. The, uh, the first way is called virtual paths. Um, so if you name a directory starting with a percent sign, see so you can follow this without an example on the board. If I have in the root of my web app, I have percent year slash index.html, then in my Python section, my request section, on my request object, I have um, request.path gives me a year key, which has that value. Does that make sense? So you're doing it in the, um, actually in the name of the directories where you're naming what that variable name is gonna be. That's the easiest answer. Yeah. Was there back there? It was the same question. Okay, yeah. So I really like Django's ORM because I get to be lazy and not deploy an SQL. Yeah. Is there anything like that for Aspen? Um, I'm not bundling any ORM with Aspen right now, which means you can use, I don't, are there standalone Django ORM implementations that are viable? Not really. You know, so you would use SQL Alchemy. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, Right, so I use, I actually don't mind SQL, and I'm doing a lot with Mongo these days too. Um, yeah, so you would bring that to the table. How are you using this in a real world? How am I using this? Um, right now, this is being used uh, on, I'm using it in my company, so it's, it's uh, powering one of our internal tools. Um, so we've got four or 500 employees, and I've got, I'm in charge of some internal tools that are using this. This has actually been around, I started this in 2006, so pretty much everything I've done for the past five years has been with Aspen in one form or another, just if you haven't heard of any of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's it looking like in terms of scalability? Have you hit an upper limit with it? It's going to depend on the uh, engine you're using underneath it. Um, you know, you can plug this into G Unicorn as a whiskey app and, and you're off and running. Uh, you know, Aspen doesn't Aspen doesn't add that much overhead. Doesn't really add that much overhead because these um, these resource files are cached as far as they can be, right? So these uh, Python pages are actually um, compiled, right? Is that the call for it, right? They're they're compiled the bytecode and then exact over and over again. Um, so it's it is not. Oh, you messing around with it there? Um, No, it's fine. What is it? And also, I saw that you're using yeah. Threads. Well, okay, so the default engine is Cherry Pie's Wizgy server. Um, and I went with that because it's uh, pretty modular, so I could include it in the code base, and you don't have an extra dependency, right? Um, but the engines that are supported are Cherry Pie. Is it Rocket? Is that the Cherry Pie clone? And then Eventlet, uh, Diesel, and Pants, which are some other networking libraries. I don't have a G event one yet. Was there, Nick, did you have a question? Or? Could you explain how to, how you uh, deal with like not having .html and everything in your URLs? Not having .html? Okay, so a couple ways to, I don't mind .html, I don't mind extensions. I like, I like when extensions indicate the MIME type of the resource that's actually being delivered, right? I mean, I don't like a .php extension because I'm not getting a .php resource, you know what I mean? If it's a .html or a .png, because you could use that. Those even those those template resources can spit out PDF. It can spit out you know XLSX, whatever you want, right? Um, so I don't mind those. Um, if you do, then you know one option is to have directories with index HTML in them. Okay. Um, another option, which was the second uh, answer to Green Shirt's question, I didn't get your name, but um, awesome score. There is a rewrite module that I've used in the past for Aspen, and it's sitting in there and just hasn't quite been cleaned up for the latest code base, um, which provides you know Swiss Army knife for rewriting URLs as they come in, uh, based on regular expressions, mapping them to files. Okay, that would be an example of progressive enhancement. You know, first you would go for the virtual path thing, then if you needed something more complex, you would jump into uh, rewrites. So if you want to take that and clean it up and check it in, I'm looking forward to the pull request. Yeah. Do you have a plugin architecture for your templates? And also, the other one, um, uh, any additional like plugins to handle different uh, uh, MIME types? Like 
the re return PDF in your example? Um, templating is not uh, pluggable yet. Uh, I'm not opposed to it philosophically. Just, you know, Tornado was good enough and, you know, I'm not out to, well, yeah, whatever. Um, for some reason, people were bugging me about the networking libraries, and so I um, went ahead and, it, that's, well, I'm wondering. So no, you're stuck with Tornado for now, although I look forward to the pull request. I'm, that's going to be my theme for the last five minutes. And the second one was uh, handlers for MIME types. Yeah. So what do you yeah, envision? Yeah, so like, yeah. handling different extensions. Um, handling, so, um, I don't know. I would need to understand from you more exactly what you mean. Maybe we can sidebar that. In one specific case, yeah. depending on the request, I may return data in an Excel file, in XML, in JSON, in a PDF. Yeah. Um, in that specific case, uh, you'd have one file for each different type. Okay. Now, how do you handle the delivery, the, the delivery of that data? Are you going to drive it all through the same like binary output mm. style? Um, no, it's handled by... Um, by the MIME types module in Python. So you do a MIME types lookup on that and you get the, the uh, you know, so if, if your extension, if it's a .pdf file, then Aspen is gonna see that it's an application slash PDF and it's gonna deliver it with that content to type header. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, so you have, you have API that allows me to feed in arbitrary binary data if I need so to. So you can put, um, yeah, like you could put any file on this. If it doesn't recognize it, then it'll default. I think right. I think it's defaulting to text plane, but I think that's a configuration option. So if you want it to default to application octet stream or whatever, then you can configure that. Um, so, for example, say I have like res my resource directory. Okay. Um, and then inside of it, I have like an index.html, yep. an index.json, index.xml. Okay. Um, will it use like the accept header to determine which one to send mm. back, or will it just send index.html? Yeah, it's not doing that right now. There is um, there is a, a hooks um, abstraction in Aspen, so you can uh, you can influence the request and response at a global level. Um, you know, so you could hack that on. That's sort of a you know, fall back if you need to hack something on like that. You do have hooks. Um, yeah. Yeah, it could be where you do that. You just check the accept header and change, you would modify the URL path on the way in. Yeah. Are you planning on doing a lightning talk on moms at all? Uh, I wasn't planning on it. We could. Um, how many? Two and a half? All right, let's see what we can do. So, Mongs is another open source project of mine. Let's see, where, I don't, oh, I can stand it up here. So I probably have it on localhost. It is, it is built using Aspen. So this is Mongs. Mongs is a data browser for MongoDB. Who's using MongoDB? A couple people? Okay. Um, so MongoDB is one of these NoSQL fancy databases, right? And the tool support isn't obviously as mature for these because um, they're new, okay? So we're, oh, I don't have that up for you. I'm sorry. Lame. I'm also running out of battery. I can't double click because I'm not on Windows, sucker. I love, I love how Steve Jobs decides what I mean by maximize window. Really? Really? Anyway, so this, what's that? Oh, okay, so I'm behind the times. Yeah. All right, so this is, this is Mung's, and it's using, uh, this would be an example of, you. Uh, what I'm going to show, whatever, blah, foo. I don't know. All right, so th these are the abstractions that you get in MongoDB. You get a server, which gives you databases, which give you collections and documents. Think of as dictionaries, okay? Key value store. Um, but what I want to point out is that up here in the address bar, this would be an example of the dynamic virtual pathing, right? So inside, let me show you the code. Um, if I got time, how am I doing? Do I have 30 seconds? Yeah, so much time. All right. All right. We'll see my battery might run out before the clock does. I give no quarter to the battery. All right. So let's jump up here to La 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 la. Work with monks. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to bring this over as soon as I have it. Up. All right. All right, so here's a little code for you. This is the index.html 
four mungs, and you can see that we'll, we're pulling this. Uh, what are we doing? So I'm getting, so this is configuration. Website is a magic object I get. It gives me a conf, which is um, file configuration uh, all folded together. There's a mung section in that, getting servers out of it. So that's the API for configuration. I don't know, you guys can see what I'm doing, right? Um, let's open up the something nested a little bit. Let me show you on the file system, right? Um, we're, ah, ah, type chain. No, it's going to explode. Okay. So there's a server directory, right? Percent server. That's where the server key comes from in, in request.path inside of that. All right. We're out of time, everyone. Percent server index HTML. Let's open the right file. Request.pathserver. Okay, thank you all. Check it out. Aspen.io.